Yeah, well, um, after reviewing the tape, it's kind of like we thought um, after the game. Not not a bunch jumped out that changed our opinion on how, how the guys played. You know, I thought we made strides in all three phases. And, um, you know, it was played a lot of guys like we kind of usually do. And I, th I think guys are... Um, you know, there's no substitute for those game reps. And I think guys are still learning, growing, improving. And, uh, you know, on to a new challenge this week. What happened on the fake field goal? Um, like I said, miscommunication. It, it, the, the look was there. It, we just got to execute. I mean, it was exactly. So that was the miscommunication. I, I wanted to kick the field goal. And, and not go for big. We, we, we got stuff always dialed up. And whether we're supposed to run them or not, is we get in and out of stuff. And so it was just bad communication on my part. Chris, what about the play before? When the pass went to Pacelli, but it was shorter than Yeah. Was there a miscommunication? Or was there something that was off on that play? No, no. Sometimes coverages are different and fires it in there. But, you know, it's obviously... You know, there's, they're always changing coverages. There's always different looks. And, you know, short of the end zone, we'd like to maybe take a shot in the end zone right there, but it is what it is. After reviewing the, the try-on hit, what did what'd you take away from, what did you see from that? Well, it's no different than we always talk about. You know, it's all about strike zone. Don't leave it in the officials' hands because you can see what can happen. So that's on, you know, that's on us. We've got to keep lowering the, lowering the strike zone. Was this the best game to date this year for your passing game, you think? Um, yeah, I, you know, I think there was good progress there. And, um, you know, probably collectively, collectively as a group, you know, from the quarterback to the wideouts. And, you know, I thought those guys caught the ball well. You know, obviously Jacob threw it in there pretty well. So probably as a group is pretty good. Has he shown anything as a passer through four games that, you know, is he ahead of, of where you thought he'd be at this point in, in any way, any part of this game? I don't really know where I thought he would be. I know he's improving. You know, he's a lot different now than he was five weeks ago. And that's how it should be, you know. And um, that's what you really like. When guys are steadily making progress, and he's been doing that. How is he different in your mind in the last five weeks just as far as areas of the game he's growing in? Yeah, I just think he's seeing it. He's commanding our offense better. There's still areas that we're tightening up that he's, you know, there's, you know, it's one thing to know it on the chalkboard. It's another thing when looks are changing, how we're calling things. We're always game planning. And there's a lot there on, on a quarterback's plate. And um, so just – being more familiar with that and there is some carryover from game to game which helps things and um, you know certain things are new and we we're always mindful of how much newness to put on everybody's plate. Staying on the uh, how they different five weeks later the offensive line what have you seen from them and uh, yeah I think they're playing at a pretty good level um, you know it's a that's one area on the offense that's pretty pretty experienced, and they've been through a lot of a lot of games. And um, you know, I think they're they're playing good together. Um, and that'll be a better you know better question to answer after this game because I think we'll be challenged differently than we've been challenged so far. Your receivers probably have adjusted, but was there a period there where catching uh, Jacob Beeson's fastball was? A I don't think so. Um, because I think Jacob Sermon throws it just the same. Like the ball comes out of his hand really, really fast. And, um, you know, sometimes those balls need to come in there r really quickly, and they will, and sometimes they don't. Um, so, you know, I, I, it's hard to, you know, explain certain games. Maybe it was because of lightning. I don't know. You know, they're scared of lightning and the drop balls. I don't know. You know, come back the next game and they catch good. So, yeah. You guys, are, you guys, obviously, California is always going to be a huge priority for you recruit. Mm -hmm. How much of a challenge is USC's existence there when, when you're recruiting that area? Yeah. And when, when they are winning? And no doubt. USC is always going to be <laughs> – they're always going to get good players. They just are. And they, and they do, and they got a bunch of good players right now. I mean, that's just – that's just what it is, you know. Um, they've got that tradition and um, a lot of history, and you know they, 
you know, they have a good program. They really do. There's just a lot of expectations come with that situation that everybody is so hypersensitive with. And I think sometimes they look past what's going on. And I think this team that we're going to play is really improving. They got a lot of skill and and this will be our biggest challenge so far. On the recruiting trail, have you found yourselves as a staff running into them or <clears throat> on, on the same players these last couple of classes? Or? Every year it's always the same. I mean, you know, USC is going to be on the best players down there, and so are we. And, you know, you just you figure out it's about fit, right? And some guys are looking to get out of Southern California and others don't want to, and you kind of go from there. How do you potentially prepare for two different quarterbacks? I think they're similar. You know, I, we always get that question. And, I, you know, every now and again, quarterbacks are, you know, real different from team to team. Like one guy's way more of a scrambler than others. But usually there's just a lot of similarity. And that's how I see, um, you know, these two guys. I think they both done a nice job. I mean, they're throwing the heck out of the ball. They got big-time receivers and – those guys have done a nice job. Both those quarterbacks are giving the receivers chances to make plays because if you do that, those guys are going to make plays. This is this is a really good receiving core as well. Graham Harrell, obviously, from Mike Leach's tree, mm -hmm. the air raid. How similar is what they're running to maybe what you've seen? From yeah, it's definitely different than Washington State's, but you have some of the core concepts that are the same. And, you know, they certainly run the ball more. Um, you know, the Washington State, but, um, you know, both like to throw a lot. Can you get your um, mic around the fact that the, 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 uh, there's a widespread consensus that the Pac-12 is better when USC is better and that their success floats the conference boat? I don't want USC to be better. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I'm just trying to make sure the Huskies are as good as they can be, you know, and I, I get all that stuff, and I really do, and I don't worry about that. I mean, I'm just trying to make sure that we're as good as we can be, and, you know, I, I, I hear some of that stuff, and, you know, um, I think they... I think they usually are, are good, you know. I think there's tremendous expectations down there on that program, which you know how I feel about that. Um, it can be very, very hard to deal with. And I think people look by, you know, guys improving, guys getting better. You know, it's like you, you look at this team and, you know, they got young guys and they play good and they're getting better and they're improving. And um, But, you know, there's always just – so much noise around you know certain programs and that's certainly one of them that they got to deal with and we have to deal with a lot of that same stuff and that's why i'm always just trying to you know insulate our team as much as we can from the outside noise because it's really really distracting and detrimental how's Savon doing he's doing really good week to week is Quinn back available this week he is yep what do you think of McGrew's game Thought it was good, you know. Like I said after the game, you know, I, I did. I thought he's, I thought, um, you know, he saw the the lanes, the running lanes, really well. I thought he was, you know, falling forward and, you know, driving his legs and all that. I thought, you know, both those, you know, Rich Newton did a really good job too. Other than putting the ball on the ground twice, which can cost you the games, but, you know, I think he'll, I think he'll learn from that. But he's he's a you know tough. You know, he runs tough, struggles for extra yards, twisting, falling forward, and that's when that ball can get away from your body, and that's what he's got to learn. Feels like kind of silver lining of Savon not being there is you get obviously more playing time for those guys. Mm -hmm. And now that that group seems to be maybe as deep as it's been since you've been here, you, you buy that, or is that just? Yeah, you know, it's hard to know. I mean, we've had the same guys for the last few years. Now they're kind of all getting more of an opportunity with Miles not being here. Yeah. Um, but I think they've, you know, I think they've gotten better. I think they've capitalized, and um, you know, certainly we like Savon in the mix for sure. Um, you know, he helps us. The, the fumble on Richard's handoff to Sean near the goal line was that just a matter of just getting more reps, putting the ball? Yeah, the it's just a little. I mean, it's just one of those things. You know, like I always say, like certain games, you're like, how, how does that happen, right? You know, you know, Sean probably leaves a little early. Rich doesn't grab the ball firm enough. You know, he's kind of reading what's going on there. Elbow hits the ball. He doesn't, 
we run that stuff a hundred times and just game reps change things a little bit right and then in practice things kind of calm down in practice and things speed up in the games and so that's one of those you know kind of learnable learnable moments what, what is it about the wildcats specifically that you really like and maybe goal line or short yardage that we, that we usually get first downs and yards but I mean, compared to other, I mean, other go, go go look at the effectiveness of that formation. You know, I mean, you know, part of it's who's got that ball in their hands. But you know, Miles was, and again, this is four years running, but Miles was seldom slowed down in that thing there. And so we just we just kind of always liked it, and there's good stuff off it. And, it's been pretty effective. Notice too that, that you've also even kind of rotated sometimes your tackles where there's been formations where mm-hmm. Trey and Jared have literally mm-hmm. like been side by side. What, what do you like about that as opposed to maybe using other jumbo type formations? We, we, we like all that stuff, and, and that's just not that formation. Like you, you, you'll see that we're going fast, we're going slow, short yardage, medium yardage. You know, that's just part of our package of what we do in terms of, you know, People in the stands don't know what's going on there, but the coaches and the players have to adjust to those type of things. And if they do, then we have some counter stuff off it that we're always looking at. I mean, there's a lot of chess match going on with those different formations. When a running back has a fumbling problem, which like the Seahawks are facing with Carson, what are the coaching tools to other than just emphasizing wrapping the ball? In? Well, usually the number one tool is lack of playing time. You know, I mean, that's usually always it, but... You know, I mean, no, nobody cares more about, you know, putting the ball on the ground than the guy that does it. And so, um, you know, I, I don't know. I, the running backs spend half their time working on ball security. And, but it's really hard to replicate that in practice, right, for everybody because they're just not getting hit. Like, they're getting swiped at a lot, and, and there's a lot of growth there. But, you know, in terms of, like, a guy like Rich Newton, how he runs and spinning and all that, it's, you know, the coaching point is the ball just cannot leave your body. And it's, you know, easy for us to say when a guy's doing that and the force is pulling it away. But, you know, I think it's – I think it brings more attention to detail in the little drills that they do every day. I mean, that's, that's really what it is. And um, – you know, I mean, fortunately, the, you know, we're, the game wasn't so tight that it cost us anything. So you can kind of really look at this as a silver lining that I think it'll, you know, I think it'll help him going forward. What was the reaction to the sideline when Fuller took that punt back? Touchdown? Um, yeah, that's a good question because I really wasn't paying attention to the sideline. I was paying attention to Aaron and myself and, you know, like seeing if he was going to outrun those guys and then kind of looking to make sure that our guys were not going to do anything stupid, which usually happens on a play like that. Um, what is stupid in your opinion? Just like blocking somebody that does not need to be blocked. Like the, that's just... So, you know, that was it. And then... Yeah, I just was relieved for him. I mean, it was more kind of a relief. It's just like, finally, you know, because I'm telling you, Aaron is really, really create, courageous, and he's got really, really ball, good ball skills. And over the last, like, year up to now, we have to block better for him. Like, there's been so many times where he's caught the ball and been hit right away, counting on somebody holding up. And you usually have to make a guy miss. Usually it's that first guy miss, but we it can't be bang, bang. You know, you got to have a little bit of space and so we've been on that hard and our guys gave gave him a little bit of space the first one we thought we were gonna get something done on the first one but one of our guys just let a guy run right by him when Aaron was because I said why'd you feel that and he's like I thought he was gonna block him you look at the tape it's like I see what you're seeing then the next one we get we get enough space and he's able to do a little something you said after the game that Brian Bowman was like a, like a curveball hitter. Yeah. I wonder if you could kind of expound on what you mean by that. Well, you know, he's really explosive and powerful, and but he's not on the tall, long side. You know, he can kind of get under guys. Usually he's going against guys that are, you know, so much taller than him and longer, those tackles. But he's really quick, and he can kind of get under things. and. It's just different than a lot of the defensive ends rush. And he plays really, really hard. You know, he's got a lot of respect for that guy in terms of he practices hard and he plays hard. And he's just kind of got a little bit of a unique style to him, which I think is kind of neat. When you got a stupid score situation like that, what are kind of the rules that the linebackers get by when you? Generally, a lot of people around you fall on it. 
not a lot of people. Let's see what we can we can go with. And you always got to kind of make that decision. You know, those are you know judgment decisions. And on tape, though, when you saw it, you saw Hodge kind of lunge mm-hmm. for it. Were you would you have maybe advised Brandon to just jump on it? Or we always tell the guys this: we can't coach you if we don't if you don't do what we tell you to do. We can't coach you if you only do what we tell you to do. Like there's got to be instincts involved, right? And so there's a lot of gray area there that they got to go play. And you got to let them play and trust their instincts. And sometimes it's right and sometimes it's not. But you're always trying to replicate as much of the game of that in practice as you can. And so we work on all those fumble drills, you know, kind of the whole group, small group, whole group. And when it happens in practice, which is not a lot because the ball doesn't come out a ton in those fumble situations, just like we talked about. But it does on occasion, and they are all about trying to make those decisions. And they, they create, our coaches kind of recreate those drills a little bit. And it was awesome, right? I mean, I mean, it's just like you'd say, it executed like it, like it should have been. Was it a little bit gray? Were there people around? Yeah, but, you know, you got you to gotta go play ball. Chris, on the, uh, I think it was the last touchdown to Bushman. Keith was right there for a pick. Yeah. I mean, is there anything that's technically you can do <laughs> Is that just bad luck, or I think that's another one. Like, huh? How does that happen? You know? Yeah. I don't know what to say to that. And then on that kind of topic, Eli was close to look, looking like he was close to two or three of those on on Saturday. Eli, who? Eli Mold. Elijah. Elijah Molden. <laughs> We good? No, no. <laughs> gotcha. That threw me. I'm serious on that. Close to like three picks. Yeah. Saturday. Yeah. He'll get his game overall. Good. Very good game. Yeah. He was one of the guys who played at a really high level, and he was good. He, he covered well and tackled well, um, and he keeps covering like that. He'll, he, he, you know, the ball will come come our way because he was close, and it was really good coverage. Eli. Huh? Nobody calls him Eli? Not that I've heard. God. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. That's why I'm scared to death till the game ends. Always. And it doesn't matter what the score is. Like... I've seen it happen. Sometimes it's rare, but I've seen it happen. Teams get a few plays. Momentum changes fast. Guys get on their heels a little bit. It's uh, it's just not over till it's over. Chris, when you, maybe when you see a game like Fridays, when you see a game with Utah and USC, for instance, and the quarterback goes out in the second play, and then you're in a situation where you're up, there's a 45-12. Yeah. And then it does – yeah. Does that ever come into your mind? Well, it does. We want to get we want to get guys into the game, and sometimes you know you're competing, and you know, and we just we'd thrown an interception right at the end of the third quarter, and gave up an easy touchdown, and all those things, and you, so and then you know that game, you guys see what happens there. I mean, those are all the things that are in our mind. I mean, I, it's not over, and can our can our seconds play? Heck yeah, they can. Um, but that's. You know, some of the things that we're dealing with in terms of when to put some other guys in. Any, any doubt in your mind in terms of bringing in Sermon? No, I think he does a good job, and we probably should have put him in earlier, um, you know. But, you know, we're still in that grind it out and make sure mode, and um, sometimes the rhythm can change when you just put other guys in. What did you see from... Yeah, Malachi, they're running back. Yeah. I mean, I think they got a lot of talent. I do. I think um, uh, Stephen Carr, I mean, the other running. I mean, they got good players. They really do. And I think this, that UFC team is improving. I mean, we know all those guys. We know them very well because we've looked at them all in recruiting and all those type of things. So we've not only knew them in high school, um, you know, followed them since they've been there. And, um, you know, and then you study them on tape. And we haven't played those guys in the last couple of years, but you get a chance to see them, and now you get a chance to study them. And, um, you know, this will be, I think this will be our biggest challenge that we've had for sure.